Hey, this is Mac with the Utah Avalanche Center. Thanks for tuning in today for this Know Before You Go brought to you by Mammut. If you've seen our Know Before You Go program before, you're probably familiar with these five pillars that we really try to focus on. Get the gear, get the training, get the forecast, get the picture, and get out of harm's way. Today we're going to be focusing on those latter two, getting the picture and getting out of harm's way. And in particular, how it relates to terrain management. You can see here on the bottom right corner our avalanche triangle, right? The three variables that make the right conditions for an avalanche to occur. We have weather, snowpack, and terrain. And luckily, terrain is the only piece of that triangle that we can have full control over when we're in the backcountry. So we're really going to focus on that today. And when we think about terrain management, we really just want to train our eyes to recognize what avalanche terrain looks like when we're in the backcountry. Looking at this slide here, does this look like avalanche terrain? Well, let's find out. At first, it might seem like a fairly benign slope, but as soon as we put someone on that piece of terrain, we get an avalanche. Same with these pictures. Do they look like avalanche terrain? Some of them probably not, right? Traveling on flat ground, traveling on ridges and subridges is a really great idea to avoid putting yourself in danger. And when you do have to be on a slope, you want to make sure that that slope is under 30 degrees and not connected to anything else. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Furthermore, when we're looking at a slope, just because it has tracks on it does not mean that it's safe, especially when we have a persistent weak layer problem. All of these avalanches you see here on this slide have tracks previously on the slope, and it took just the right amount of weight in the right spot on that slope to trigger an avalanche. Tracks do not indicate safety. Let's talk about slope angle. Slope angle is going to be your friend when you're thinking about avalanche terrain. Slopes over 45 degrees in steepness are often too steep for a slab to form and for an avalanche to occur. Slopes under 30 degrees in steepness generally don't avalanche because there's just not enough energy for that slab to pull down the hill. Slopes between those two zones, though, 30 and 45 degrees, is prime avalanche terrain. Unfortunately, those are the slopes we really like to ski. If we're thinking about a ski resort, um, a, a more advanced blue trail or a black diamond trail or a double black diamond trail are often between 30 and 45 degrees in steepness, which is right where we want to be skiing. But that's not to say we can't go have a great time on slopes under 30 degrees. When the avalanche danger is high, I have great days out there skiing powder on less than 30 degree slopes. You don't need something steep to have fun. Let's talk about convexities for a little bit. Convexities uh, are parts of the slope where uh, you go from relatively flat terrain to steeper terrain. And those are right where avalanches like to occur. If we think about a candy bar and we're bending it and bending it, it's going to break right on that cusp. Same with avalanches. They love to occur on these convexities. You can see here from the photos, all these avalanches broke right on those rollovers. And the opposite of a convexity is a concavity, which isn't necessarily um, a piece of terrain where avalanches like to occur, but it is something we need to think of in terms of terrain traps. If an avalanche came down from above and ended in a concavity, where is that snow going to go? It's just going to pile up really, really high because there's nowhere for that snow to slide. So if you get caught in even a small avalanche and end up in a concavity, you could have devastating consequences. Let's take a look at this video here of the snowmobiler coming up and over a convexity. So you can see they're just entering the slope right on this rollover, right where the convexity is. And boom, avalanche occurs right on that rollover, right, right where we were expecting it to happen. When we talk about slope angle, we use tools uh, that are existing on topographic maps to determine how steep a slope is. These things are called contour lines. And a contour is just a line on a map that joins points of equal height. So theoretically, if you were to travel directly on a contour line, you wouldn't be gaining or lowering an elevation on the slope. You'd be traveling on a flat path. Uh, and when we look at topographic maps, we're looking for how tightly spaced those contour lines are. Contour lines that are squished up really close together means that the slope is probably pretty steep. 
Uh, areas where those contour lines are more spaced out indicates a gentler slope, and those are areas that I'm looking to ride, especially on high danger days. And luckily, we have tons of mapping applications now that allow us to judge slope angle before we even go out into the field. A lot of mapping applications nowadays will have slope angle shaded maps that indicate the slope angle on a slope. Now these things aren't set in stone perfect all the time, but they give us a really good indication of what to expect before we even go out into the snow. I spend a lot of time looking at these maps on my couch the night before a tour uh, or the week before if I'm thinking about a bigger objective. Let's take a look at this slope here. Where would we expect an avalanche to occur? Well, for me, it's right there in that middle starting zone, the area that looks like the most fun place to ski, right? That might be in your face avalanche terrain. But what we also have to think about is terrain that's connected to that piece of the slope, right? If we're picturing a row of dominoes underneath the snow, all we have to do is trigger one domino in one spot for that to have a chain reaction and for an avalanche to occur on a slope that might be right next to you. That weight of that avalanche can then trigger an avalanche above you. So we're always thinking about connected terrain when we're out in the backcountry. Just because you're not on a piece of uh, terrain that's above uh, 45, or between 30 and 45 degrees in steepness does not mean that you're totally safe and clear from avalanches. We wanna be looking at what's above us, what's besides us, what are we gonna be skiing down into? When we're in the backcountry, we can use uh, pieces of terrain called test slopes to give us an indication of what the snow stability is doing before we even get into consequential terrain. You can see here in this video I'm about to play, uh, a skier is just going for a walk on a relatively flat piece of uh, terrain, and there's a small steep slope directly next to the road, probably a road cut. Let's see what happens when this skier steps foot on this non-consequential terrain. So right there we see that if you were to step on a, a steeper piece of terrain, there is a possibility for an avalanche. Here an avalanche didn't occur because it's non-consequential terrain. We call this free information. We can get an idea of what's happening up high on steeper terrain without actually putting ourselves in danger. These test slopes are great to poke around on when you're walking up to your objective to get an idea of what the snow might be doing on steeper slopes. Terrain traps, you heard me mention this term before. Uh, terrain traps are just pieces of terrain that might elevate the consequences of yourself getting caught in an avalanche. Things like gullies, sharp transitions, trees, cliffs, rocks, or just a really large avalanche path can get you in trouble even with just a small avalanche breaking. Right, like I said before when we were talking about concavities, if a small avalanche breaks and puts you in a gully, where's that snow gonna go? has nowhere to go other than pile up above you and it's gonna bury you pretty deep in that debris pile. Other things when we're talking about terrain traps are cornices or benches in the slope, road cuts. Um, we wanna give cornices a very wide berth when we're walking around the mountains. When I'm walking on a ridge, I often try to find where trees or rocks are poking up out of the snow and staying even beyond that. Um, so I know that I have solid ground beneath my feet rather than just a hanging piece of snow over a steep slope. Let's talk about different types of terrain. Uh, we have three types of terrain that we like to talk about in avalanche classes. Simple, challenging, and complex terrain. This is a great example of simple terrain you can see here. Right? This is up in Willow Fork in the Cottonwood Canyon area of, of Utah. Uh, tons of slope angles that are below 30 degrees. Right, you can see 20, 25 degrees, uh, maybe a piece that's 35 to 40 degrees, but it's in a very specific spot and we can avoid it when we're traveling through this terrain. Here's a great example of challenging terrain. This is up in Beehive Basin in Montana. Sure, there's tons of uh, parts of this slope that are less than 30 degrees. You can see there on the right, we have a nice piece of tree vegetated terrain that's between 20 and 25 degrees. But if you look to the left, it gets steeper and steeper as we move on. This is challenging because even though we can stay in a safe area, we have to be very diligent in staying in that zone or else we're gonna end up on steep terrain and potentially cause an avalanche. Challenging terrain takes a little bit of know-how to get to move through uh, in the backcountry. It's not recommended for beginner backcountry enthusiasts. Here we have an example of complex terrain. 
right? Just looking at the slope angle shading map, it's in your face avalanche terrain. There's really no way to move through this safely with any kind of avalanche hazard. Complex terrain should not be entered by uh, beginner rec backcountry recreationalists or even intermediate. It takes a ton of knowledge to navigate terrain like this. Uh, and we really wait for the spring when avalanche danger lowers uh, to move through terrain like this. This is not somewhere I would want to be midwinter with any type of avalanche problem. Let's go through some examples of uh, looking at terrain and piecing together a route to try to get to an objective. Here you can see we have three potential routes, uh, A, B, and C. And let's just go through each one of those. Looking at route A on the left there, if we were to try to get to the top of that peak, um, route A would take us to the left through some non-consequential terrain. Then we'd get onto a ridge line and start entering avalanche terrain, right? You can see there from the slope angle shaded map, um, anything that's not green is considered avalanche terrain. Route B, we go right through the gut of that whole thing, right? We might be exposed on either side of us when we're walking in, in the middle of that gully. And then to get to the top of that peak, B takes us right up the middle. There could be people skiing down from above us. Or there could be an avalanche on the side of one of those slopes that might trigger a larger avalanche that can hit us. Route B is probably not one that I would take. Let's look at Route C. Route C avoids being in any kind of gully. You gain a ridge line that's low angle, and then you get to your objective a safe way. So I might pick Route C if I'm trying to get to the top of this peak, but I also want to have a couple different options in case something goes wrong, right? Maybe I have uh, my plan A would be C, and, uh, and Route A would, might be my second plan in case anything uh, comes up in the field that I'm not expecting. Let's look at another one here. This is Mount Blackmore up in Montana. We have three routes, right? A, B, and C. Again, route A is on the left. We're taking a subridge all the way to the top of that. And it looks like we're in low angle terrain. But what are we standing above? Right, steep, gnarly cliffs. If anything were to come down above us taking route A, uh, even though we're not in steep terrain, it would carry us into steep consequential terrain, not a place I would want to get caught in an avalanche. Option B, again, takes us right up the center. Again, you might have people skiing down from above you. You might trigger an avalanche on the side of the slope that then breaks wide and, and takes you out with it. Not an option that I would recommend. Looking at Route C, we're gaining the ridge through low angle trees, pretty thick trees too. And then we're just climbing that ridge all the way to the top. You might notice a pattern here, right? We're aiming for ridges and high points to ascend. We want to be the highest point on the mountain at all times. Just imagine if an avalanche were to occur, uh, given your point on the slope, what would happen? What are you going to get carried through? And when we're in avalanche terrain, if we have to be in it, we want to travel one at a time. This goes for ascending and descending. We want to cross avalanche paths spaced out or even one at a time because in the event of an avalanche, we want to expose as little people as possible to that. So we have more people to help with rescue and what have you. When we're descending, we want to ski one at a time and identify islands of safety and safe spots that we can regroup at throughout the slope. Here's a great example of a skier uh, skiing avalanche terrain and getting to an island of safety before an avalanche is able to get to them. Let's take a look. So you can see his partner standing at the top of the slope, keeping eyes on his skier. He's not dropping in on him. He's waiting, skiing one at a time. The skier gets to what looks like a pretty uh, flat zone, almost what some consider an island of safety, but an avalanche breaks. And you'll see this avalanche runs pretty far down that slope. If he were to stop anywhere short of where he does stop, he would be caught in this avalanche. We want to give our runout zones a ton of space. Make sure you're skiing well beyond where you think an avalanche can run to, and finding good areas to regroup uh, at the bottom or mid-slope uh, is essential when you're traveling through avalanche terrain. Let's go over some uh, group dynamics when traveling in the backcountry. Before we even start our day, we want to have a communication uh, with our partners, making sure everyone has a beacon shovel probe, making sure everyone feels good about the day. Is anyone tired? Did anyone not sleep last night? Um, how might that affect your travel plans? 
We want to get a judgment of how everyone's ability level is, right? We don't want to leave someone out in the dust as we are climbing to the top of a mountain. We turn around and our partner's all the way at the bottom. We want to stay relatively close together, although spaced out just enough not to avoid, not to expose multiple people uh, to a dangerous part of the slope at one time. Uh, and just having an open dialogue throughout the day, checking in on your partners, making sure everyone feels good about the plan, and making sure that all decisions are uh, community-based and not one person is running the show. Let's talk about a case study. Last year in the Wasatch Mountains, we had uh, a pretty terrifying snowpack for most of the season. We had a persistent weak layer that was causing massive avalanches. Um, we didn't seem to get much of a break until late, late spring. It was a really tricky time to be in the backcountry. January 30th of last year, 2021, uh, a group of three experienced backcountry riders went out for a mellow day in the mountains, right? They went to a zone that they had all been to before, some of which even the week prior. It was an area they were super familiar with. It was almost in their backyards. The new snow that day was about boot top height. They dug a snow pit, and they successfully skied a south-facing line just next to this one you can see on the slope before traveling up and going for a second lap. Their second lap was planned to follow this blue line you can see on the map. And we have a slope angle overlay on this map too. And you can see that although they're staying non in avalanche terrain for most of the time, they are crossing this one tiny rollover that you can see from that slope angle shading. On the right, you can see some pictures of that slope in the summer. Some might say this looks very benign and they would not expect an avalanche to occur on it. Here's a picture of that rollover looking up from the summer. That rollover is in fact just a small rock band, maybe six feet tall, right on the cusp of that rollover. Remember, we are talking about uh, convexities before. Here's that same rollover in the winter after this avalanche occurred. Insanely small piece of terrain that can have big consequences. And you can see this little tiny avalanche path ends up running into some trees. Uh, you can see in this photo from the summer down in the bottom right, this avalanche actually pushed some trees over. And it actually buried one of the party's, party members as well. Luckily, everyone made it out okay. The rescue was successful and no one got hurt. Everyone made it back to their car at the end of the day. But this just goes to show you that even a small piece of, uh, a small rollover uh, on a slope can have big consequences, right? Any part of the slope that's over 30 degrees is gonna be on my mind when I'm skiing. I'm not overlooking the small things. And let's talk about some things that we're looking out for when we're moving through terrain that might indicate rising avalanche danger. Number one and most important, recent avalanches. Avalanches are a herd species. You'll rarely see just one occur. So if I'm out there and I see an avalanche occur on a slope, I'm paying attention to what aspect was that on? What elevation? What was the trigger? What was the time of day? All these things are gonna help me make decisions uh, for my own route plan to avoid slopes similar to that. Number two, cracking and collapsing. Uh, collapsing is also known as wumping. If you've ever been traveling on a flat piece of terrain in the snow, and all of a sudden you feel yourself sink about two inches, or hear a, a loud audible wumph, it's very humbling. And in fact, that actually was an avalanche that just didn't have the right slope angle to slide. You're failing that weak layer, and you're, you're witnessing um, the potential deadliness of that avalanche. Number three, recent wind-drifted snow. Wind can move snow almost 10 times as fast as what it falls from the sky. And as such, we like to say wind is the architecture of avalanches. After a storm, if a, a big wind event comes in, I'm paying attention to what direction is that wind pushing the snow into. How much new snow is there available to move? Number four, heavy snowfall, or that four-letter word we try to not say, rain. Heavy snowfall and rain add a ton of weight to our snowpack, and snowpack, like people, don't like rapid change. Anytime there's a new rapid weight added to the snowpack, snowpack you can bet there's going to be some avalanches out there. Whenever there's new snowfall or, unfortunately, a rain event, I try to give the mountains a few days to adjust to that new weight before I go traveling in avalanche terrain. Number five, rapidly warming temperatures. We're almost in full springtime mode here in Utah, and we're seeing the days get warmer and warmer. 
that can cause some instabilities in the snow. Some indications that it's getting too hot out there are these cinnamon rolls, pinwheels, roller balls, whatever you want to call them. If you start seeing them come down on you in the mountains, it's time to turn around or head to shadier, more protected slopes. What avalanches are really tricky to uh, predict and forecast for, but luckily we get some clues that indicate when they might occur. So we just talked a ton, right? We talked about terrain traps, slope angles, um, challenging terrain, simple terrain, complex terrain. Um, but what I want to stress here is that when the snowpack is in question, terrain is the answer. We have complete control of where we travel in the mountains. We can decide whether or not to go somewhere with our group. And when, terrain, when snowpack's in question, all we have to say is, you know what, I'm sticking to terrain under 30 degrees, not connected to anything, and you can still have a great time out there skiing low angle pow. I want to thank you for tuning in today. I want to give a big shout out to our sponsor, Mammut, for helping put on this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you out there on the skin track. Thank you. <laughs>